In over 40 cases, he got off scot-free. That's if you include the times he just straight up escaped from jail while awaiting trial. America has always been a land of opportunity, even for scammers. How many counterfeit dollars do you think are in circulation today? The answer might surprise you. So sit back and let's talk about money. Long before the US had a central bank, even before it became its own country, counterfeiting was rampant. You see, back in the day, up until the early 1900s, money was decentralized, which is to say it was controlled by the people instead of any central body, like a bank or a government. Now, if you lived in the colonies, you'd probably have at least one of the following a handful of British pounds, Spanish silver coins, or paper money from your local colony. You might even have a mix of all three. The problem was that not all of the coins and paper money were accepted universally. So people would have to travel around with a bunch of different kinds of money in their pockets. That's a lot of hassle. But for places that accepted colonial paper money over pounds and silver, people found a way to cheat the system. Paper currency was pretty easy to copy back then, especially if you had access to a printing press. It wasn't long before security measures were added. Our bills today contain a bunch of anti-counterfeit features. We weren't always so advanced. Advanced, though. You know Ben Franklin, right? The guy on this bill? He printed money for New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. He purposely spelled Pennsylvania wrong on his banknotes to prevent counterfeiters. Let's fast forward a bit. During the Civil War, the US government needed money to pay for its war effort. So it did what it always does when it needs money. It printed more. This was the first time that the US government started printing its own paper money. And there's no time like a war to get in on that sweet, sweet counterfeit money action. Samuel Upham, one of the most famous counterfeiters in US history, knew this and took full advantage. During the Civil War, he owned a stationery store and began selling novelty Confederate dollars. The only difference from the real stuff was small text at the bottom that read facsimile, confederate note. But people could simply cut this off the bill. And next thing you know, confederate smugglers were placing orders by the wagon load. He printed fake five and ten dollar bills like it was his job which it was. Suddenly, Sam found himself caught between the warring governments. The Union wanted him to quit his operation, fearing that the Confederacy would retaliate by producing fake Union dollars. And the bills were so convincing that the Confederate Congress declared counterfeiting a crime punishable by death. But as a Union resident, the Confederacy couldn't really get to Sam. And the Union's hands were tied since they didn't recognize Confederate money as legitimate currency. So technically, Sam wasn't breaking their laws. I guess Sam got the best of Uncle Sam. And also the Confederacy, but I couldn't think of a pun for that. By 1865, counterfeiters flooded the market with fake currency. So much so that it was becoming hard for the government to distinguish between real and fake bills. So what did they do? They created the Secret Service to combat counterfeiters. That's right, those guys with the earpieces protecting presidents with a 95% success rate were originally just supposed to chase down the fake paper trail. But it wasn't enough. The counterfeiting continued. The government's solution? Take even more control over America's currency system. By the early 1900s, the US government took complete control over money in America. This marked the end of all decentralized money in the states and the beginning of complete centralization. Nowadays, almost all money in America is controlled by the US government. The Federal Reserve System, which was created in 1913, regulates the supply of money in our economy. And although there are still some gold and silver coins in circulation, most of our currency is just good old paper money. Not necessarily worth anything tangible except for its value as a piece of printed paper. And yet, even with the centralized system, counterfeiting continued to flourish, thanks in no small part to the legendary Victor Lustig, also known as the Count. He was a con man so brilliant that he pulled off one of the greatest scams ever, twice. That's right, in 1925, Victor Lustig sold the Eiffel Tower, not once, but twice. Not a model of it, not a replica, the real deal. How did he do it? Well, first he pretended to be a government official and offered to sell the Eiffel Tower to a French scrap metal dealer. Lustig wined and dined the guy and convinced him that the government thought it was so ugly they wanted it gone. In fact, the man was so convinced that the tower was being sold, he wrote Lustig a huge check for the sale. Lustig then disappeared into thin air with the money in hand. Shortly after, the mad lad did it again. This time, with another scrap metal dealer. He fled the country after the second sale of the Eiffel Tower because he feared he would be caught. But he continued his life of crime in America. In America, Lustig started selling a non-working counterfeit machine he called a money box. In over 40 cases, he got off scot free. That's if you include the times he just straight up escaped from jail while awaiting trial. In 1930, Lustig teamed up with a chemist named Tom Shaw and got into the counterfeiting business. They used plates, paper, and ink that matched the tiny red and green fibers in real bills. Federal agents finally caught up with Lustig in the spring of 1935, thanks to a tip from his girlfriend, who had a change of heart after learning the Count was cheating on him. While awaiting trial, the Count bragged that no prison could hold him. Unfortunately, his luck wouldn't last forever. But it did that day. The day before his trial, he casually repelled out of the jail with a bedsheet he fashioned into a rope while pretending to be a window washer on his way down. Lustig was arrested a month later and sentenced to 20 years in Alcatraz, where he died. Due to expert scammers like the Count, 
the U.S. government has had to keep creating a number of security features built into U.S. currency, making it easier to identify counterfeits, which is how we ended up with things like watermarks, which are visible when bills are held up to a light, security threads that run along a bill, like a thin strip of plastic, microprinting that requires a magnifying glass to see, raised ink that can be felt when you run your finger over a bill, and color-shifting ink that changes color when you tilt the bill. But even some of these security measures have been hacked. In fact, according to the United States Department of Treasury, an estimated 70 to $200 million of counterfeit bills are in circulation at any given time. Even in 2012, Frank Burrisaw managed to print over $250 million worth of counterfeit money before he was caught. Frank had a plan to get rich. His plan? Make millions of dollars. Fake ones, of course. There was only one problem. How was he going to print them? It's not like you can set up a printing press in your garage and start churning out cash. You need expensive equipment, and the paper has to be special too. It's hard to forge. So Frank did what any good criminal would. He lied. He actually conned a mill that could provide the paper used for U.S. banknotes. Frank strolled into the mill claiming to represent an investment company looking for secure paper for bonds. The mill agreed to help, but said it would be costly. Second, he had to buy the very expensive printing equipment and software, which he used to set up a secret printing shop, the location of which to this day is unknown. When all was said and done, he had printed $250 million, fake dollars, which he promptly sold to criminal gangs. It was all going so well. His big investment paid off as he started raking it in. But then one day, someone Someone placed an order with Frank. Little did Frank know his customer was an undercover cop, which is how Frank went to prison in theaters and streaming this fall. If you want to learn more about the law, hit subscribe and check out some of my other videos here.